I'm recording the worship materials for May 24, 2020, the seventh Sunday of Easter. Hello, welcome to this worship today. We are still coming to you via video recording, and we are grateful for that opportunity and also for your willingness to watch and listen. I am Reverend Jerry Groth. We thank you for your continuing support of Advent's ministries. We need that support during this very different time in our nation's life and in our congregation's life. Please send your offering to our church office or drop them off at the church. They will be received gratefully. Today is the seventh Sunday of Easter. It is also the day before Memorial Day. The message of Easter is still with us, and so we begin with portions of Psalm 68, the psalm appointed for this day. May God lead us in our worship and direct us. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. You sent a bountiful rain, O God. You restored your inheritance when it languished. Sing to God, O kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord. Ascribe power to God, whose strength is in the skies. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Let us pray the prayer of the day. O God of glory, your Son, Jesus Christ, suffered for us and ascended to your right hand. Unite us with Christ and each other in suffering and in joy, that all the world may be drawn into your bountiful presence. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel for this day is written in St. John's Gospel, chapter 17, reading at the first verse. After Jesus had spoken these words to his disciples, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made your name known to those whom you gave me from the world. They are yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you, for the words that you gave me I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours." All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of the Lord. I begin the sermon in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. I think we've reached it. I think we've reached the point where we don't want to hear certain words anymore, words like thoughts and prayers. They're just too trite. They don't express real sympathy, and they're worn out. Mass shootings, thoughts and prayers. Earthquake, thoughts and prayers. 
tornado thoughts and prayers. Homes burned to the ground, thoughts and prayers. Untimely death, thoughts and prayers. Suicide, thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers, thoughts and prayers. Today we are hearing the word of John's Gospel, chapter 17. And it is about prayer. It is about a high priestly prayer spoken by Jesus. There was danger ahead when the prayer was spoken. There was death. Jesus knew his death was at hand, and the disciples knew that too. But what the disciples didn't know was how the death of Jesus would work out for them. But how does anything in life, good and bad, turn out? How does it affect us? Christer Stendhal, a well-known New Testament scholar, told a group of biblical scholars at a conference how he got into church and biblical scholarship. He said, quite simply, my family and I were not church people at all, and the only way I could rebel against the way my family was was to go to church. And when I got to church within six months, I fell in love with Jesus. That's how it affected his life. And that's how life can work out. That's how God can work through the situations and the experience of our life. The ministry of Jesus was basically a three-year period that began when he was about 30 years old. His hometown was Nazareth. He traveled on foot to the towns of Galilee, where he taught in the synagogues on hillsides from fishing boats and where he also healed the people. He welcomed children and women and associated with people who were labeled unclean, untouchable, and outcast. And by that, he challenged those super-religious people. You know, the ones who believe themselves better and holier and superior to others. He finally made his way to Jerusalem. He was arrested because accusers said he disturbed the peace of the people. He was put on trial. He was executed by soldiers, Roman soldiers, soldiers of the army occupying the land of the Jews. And so I must ask, what was the real reason for his arrest and trial and death? Was it politics? Was it religion? Was it both? We could discuss that for a very long time, and some do. They take delight in discussions like that. But what we know is Jesus had friends. The New Testament calls them disciples. He appointed them to live as he lived. He told them to love others. He told them to tell the story of God's plan for justice and compassion and forgiveness and truth and fairness for people all around the world. And for that and for his disciples, Jesus prayed. Keep them safe, he prayed. Protect them, he prayed. May they find a way to be one, he prayed. But we have to say, Christians, to our shame, have never found a way to be one, and that by choice. We find reasons, reasons also laughable, to keep Christians divided. Maybe in the future, with lots of people called Christians working hard, we can find a way. See Jesus. Know Jesus. He never questioned anyone about the content of their faith. Was it true or not? Was it orthodox or not? Jesus expects no theoretical reflection on the matters of faith. Jesus never gave us a list of necessary teachings. Believe these, get them right, 
and you're saved. He never said anything like that. It, words like that never came out of his mouth. Jesus rather expects urgent, practical decision. He just said, if you would be my disciple, follow me and do what I do. Pick up a cross, pick up a burden, pick up a challenge, pick up a mission, pick up on human wounds and work to heal them. Do the work that needs to be done. And when you do that, go for it with all your might and with all your heart. That is Jesus. Albert Schweitzer has been a hero of mine for a very long time. He died a long time ago, 1964. He was a great organist, an interpreter of the organ music of Johann Sebastian Bach. How I love that music of Bach. I listened to his organ music, Schweitzer's organ music, on those old record discs by the hour. Schweitzer was also a medical doctor. He established a hospital in a region of Africa now called Gabon. Schweitzer was also a New Testament scholar. He wrote books, one of them being The Quest for the Historical Jesus, a book many of us read carefully a long time ago and thought about it and reflected on the words written there. The book ended with these words. He, meaning Jesus, comes to us as one unknown. Without a name as of old, by the lakeside, he came to those who knew him not. He speaks to us the same word, follow me. And he sets before us the tasks which he has for us to fulfill for our time. He commands, and to those who obey him, whether they be wise or simple, he will reveal himself in the toils, the conflicts, the sufferings they pass through. And as in ineffable mystery, they shall learn in their own experience who he is. I've been listening to and watching the brief worship services, morning and evening prayer from the Washington National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. It is stunning worship, nothing supercharged. There are no religious superstars. It is just the word given to us and for us at this difficult time. The worship from that glorious cathedral centers on the person of Jesus Christ, his life, his words. And during this time of strife and difficulty and issues and pandemic disease, that worship feeds my soul. And I find myself saying, after watching and listening, sometimes even out loud, that's church. That's real church. Nothing spectacular, but lots of things solid. We follow the one who prays for us. We follow the one who will take us as we are. We follow the one who has tasks and jobs and duties for us to do. We follow the one who will wait for us, even when we are too tired to give our all right now. He will wait. His name is Jesus. We follow the one who calls us to be humble as he is humble. Our world truly needs humble people now. We follow the one who calls us to heal, whether doctor or nurse, or just a human being with a warm heart who sees the pain and hurt and death in our world and has to do something 
about that pain. His name is Jesus. We follow the one who loves us with a love that cannot be described. We follow the one who speaks truth. We follow the one who lives and reigns now and forever. We follow the one who lives us, loves us, all the way home. His name is Jesus. We pray together the prayers of intercession. Uplifted by the promised hope of healing and resurrection, we join the people of God in all times and places in praying for the church, the world, and all who are in need. We call on your spirit of unity, giving thanks for our different vocations. Activate and utilize the diverse gifts present in your church and in your world, that they reveal your love for us all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of life, present in air, wind, humidity, storms, and oxygen in our atmosphere, breathing energy into all things. Heal with your breath the whole creation, especially those who struggle to breathe due to air pollution. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of righteousness. Wherever we as a people are divided, unite us. Wherever we are prideful, humble us. Give each one of us a heart of justice and fairness and sympathy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call upon your spirit of sacrifice as we move toward Memorial Day, and we remember all those who gave so much to make our land a place of freedom and truth and compassion. Bless them all for what they gave, even their lives. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of healing. Bless nurses, doctors, midwives, chaplains, counselors, hospice workers, those we call our heroes as they care for those in need, sometimes, many times, risking their own lives. We pray for all who long for comfort. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of friendship. As Elizabeth welcomed Mary to her home, give us a spirit of welcome to those whom we meet in this congregation and outside the doors of our church. Surprise us daily with unexpected grace that we may rejoice in every blessing you send to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We call on your spirit of hope as you have led your saints in all times and in places. Stir in us the desire to follow their example, leading us from death to new life in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. With bold confidence in your love, Almighty God, we place all for whom we pray into your eternal care through Christ our Lord, and together we say, Amen. We pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may our God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you and all of us 
now and forever. Amen.